President Trump has met Russia's President Vladimir Putin face to face for the first time. The two leaders shook hands at the G20 summit in the German city of Hamburg. Let's join my colleague Ross uh, Atkins there now. Ross. Welcome to the vast conference center in Hamburg where this G20 summit is taking place. The leaders are here, they're ready to start their negotiations, moving ahead to what they hope will be a communique on Saturday afternoon with some commitments on some of the most pressing issues that our world is facing. There were efforts to stop the leaders getting in. There have been protests last night, through the night and into this morning. These are some of the pictures that we have. The German authorities are telling us that over 70 police officers have been injured across the last 24 hours. Three remain in hospital. We know that water cannon has been used as well as pepper spray. But it looks like those efforts of the protesters to disrupt the arrivals of the world leaders have not worked. Now, there are many key dynamics that we're keeping a close eye on. That meeting between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, which will happen later on. Theresa May will also be meeting Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, the Chinese president. And the context to all of these discussions is likely to be where America fits in to the global responses to the main issues of our time, the nature of trade around the world, the nature of the response to climate change. And we heard plenty of references to that in the first few hours of this G20 summit. Let's begin with the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk. I've heard yesterday in also surprisingly promising words um, from the American president about transatlantic community, about the cooperation between the United States, Europe, about our common political tradition and civilization, and about the readiness to protect and to defend the whole Western community. We have been waiting for a long time to hear these words from President Trump. But the real question is whether it was a one-time incident or a new policy. While the UK Prime Minister Theresa May is also here, there's a lot of attention on how much sway she will have, particularly after her position in domestic politics was weakened after she failed to get a majority in the House of Commons in the recent election. She's come with an agenda on a number of issues. She wants to talk about climate change, but she also wants to talk about the funding of terrorism. Here she is talking about that. Well, what I'm doing here at the G20 is raising the need for us to work collectively, internationally, to deal with terrorist financing, not just large sums of money that are financing terrorism, but also to find ways of working with the financial services, with banks and others, to identify those smaller scale transactions that can sometimes lead to terrorist activity. I believe this is important. When we deal with this terrorist threat, which we're all facing, we need to address it across a range of ways. I've already brought the international community together to look at the issue of terrorism online, of extremism online, and ensuring that the internet, working to ensure the internet cannot be a safe space for terrorists. Now I'm calling on the international community to work together to ensure that we can deal with this issue of terrorist financing. I want to take a minute or two just to get across the scale of this event. There are 5,000 journalists here, 10,000 delegates, all of the world's most powerful leaders. The G20 stands for Group of 20. That's the 19 biggest economies, the US, the UK, France, Germany, Indonesia, South Africa, Turkey, to name but some of them, plus the European Union. And you can see the scale of this conference centre. You've got TV reporters, journalists based across a vast media section. There are also areas where delegates can meet with other delegates, with politicians and also with media when they're trying to get their message out. And this conference centre stretches all the way down. It's the size of several football pitches. And as I was saying, there are some stalls set up by people who are wishing to lobby on a particular issue. Media from around the world are here as well. And the leaders are actually a lot further down there in a part of the conference sector which is even more restricted than where I am and even getting in here involved a lot of work and how this is going to work over the next couple of days is there'll be some group meetings, there'll be bilateral meetings, in particular that meeting between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. Remember that speech in Warsaw yesterday by Donald Trump when he said Russia was destabilizing Ukraine. That was the most explicit he's been on the issue of Ukraine. I guess the question we've all got 
is will he also accuse Vladimir Putin of destabilizing America? Remember, the American intelligence agencies say the Russians meddled in the US election, something that Russia denies. So that's coming up later. The meetings go on into Saturday, and then Saturday afternoon is all about a communique from all of those who have come here, along with press conferences from some of the leaders. We're not clear on how many of them will do press conferences with open questions from journalists. And we can't really overstate the power that the people here have. The G20 represents two thirds of the world's population. 80% of the world's economic output. So while there are some countries which say they feel left out, that they feel this is an unreasonable way of going about global business, the idea of the G20, which was actually born just under 20 years ago, is that this is a better decision-making arena than perhaps the UN General Assembly, and that get these people in a room and some major policy decisions can be taken. We're going to learn if that is possible over the next 48 hours, and I'll be with you live on BBC News throughout. Roz, thank you very much. Now, as we've been hearing, uh, you saw a clip a few moments ago, Theresa May has arrived at the G20 summit where she'll call on leaders to work together to cut off terrorist funding. She's been speaking to our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, who joins us now from Hamburg. So, uh, John, we heard that uh, short clip where she was talking about those plans to cut off funding to terrorists. Uh, what else has she been saying to you? Well, Theresa May has a lot of things she'll be talking about over the course of this weekend, as do all the world leaders here with a long list of global challenges on their, on their collective plate. North Korea, trade, climate change. Theresa May, of course, has the additional complication of, of needing, you could argue, to reassert Britain's influence in the aftermath of Brexit. And after a disappointing for Theresa May and the Tories, disappointing general election result. All of this so she can get on with the big business at hand like Brexit. She says, as she said to me earlier on, she meant to be bold, not timid. Now, what does that mean? One for one thing, it means answering the calls from business, organisations like the CBI, for a particular approach to Brexit. They want to see Britain, frankly, staying inside the customs union, inside the single market, until the moment that Britain finally exits the EU after a transitional period of whatever, whatever length. And that is for the sake of stability. But I put this uh, to the Prime Minister when I spoke to her a little, a little while ago. This is how that went. What I want to do is to negotiate a new trade agreement, comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union, to have that negotiated within that two-year time scale that the treaty has set. Then as a part of the uh, ongoing uh, relationship, of course, we'll need to have an implementation period when that is put into place. What I want to see is as smooth and orderly a process as possible, because it is absolutely uh, the case that none of us want to disrupt our economies. We want to ensure that we can have that smooth process. But it's important that we have that free trade agreement, that we know what that end state, what that relationship is going to be for the future, and then we're able to implement that over a period. So only very limited encouragement, really, for business in the reply that Theresa May gave to me there. She wants to see some sort of implementation phase. We don't know how long. We don't know what would happen during that implementation phase. Would there be time to prepare to exit the customs union on the single market and staying inside those frameworks in the meantime? We don't know how she's feeling about that. It'll have to work its way through, clearly, in the course of these negotiations, which are, frankly, only just getting started. And the organisations looking in, like the CBI, like all the rest of them, will just have to keep looking and pressing and lobbying and hoping. For the moment, John, thank you very much. John Pienaar. Well, uh, let me just take you to some live pictures now from Hamburg. Uh, the day after the night before, a violent night uh, with... Uh, Many police officers and protesters, protesters injured in clashes. Well, clearly a peaceful protest underway at the moment. And many of the protesters, an estimated tens of thousands of them in the city for the G20, many of them are here to protest peacefully, but uh, others are intent on violence. And we saw some violent clashes overnight with uh, around 100 police officers injured figures for the numbers of protesters injured unclear at the moment but nearly 30 people were arrested some have accused the police of a heavy-handed response but clearly given the the climate around this g20 uh the security services there 
are trying to keep a very tight lid on any demonstrations and protests that are taking place. We'll, of course, keep you right up to date with events at the G20 throughout the day, including, of course, that uh, first meeting between President Trump and President Putin.